Hey, what's up? MKBHD here. Yes, that was the Rimac Concept One, which by the end of this video will be the fastest car I've ever driven. This is the Insta360 Go 2, which is one of the neatest, weirdest little cameras I've ever used. But first, we gotta start with the fastest drone I have ever flown. There's a lot of stuff in this video. This is dope tech. All right, so to dramatically oversimplify, there are basically two types of drones. The first one is the one we've kind of all seen and heard of, the film tool. So something like this, which is DJI's Mavic. And DJI has gotten extremely good at these and currently leads this space. They've got the Mavic 2, the Spark, and the Phantom, and all these drones are designed to make it as easy as possible to capture high quality aerial footage. So they've got high quality camera systems on multi-axis gimbals, they're all built in. They can run pre-programmed flight paths and they can even follow objects automatically. They have obstacle avoidance built in and they're easy enough to learn that someone who's literally never flown a drone before can pick one up and on their first try, get a pretty good smooth 4K shot because that's what they're designed to do. And then on the other side of the fence, there are FPV drones. FPV standing for first person view, also commonly known as these racing drones. And you might've even seen them on TV lately as ESPN is showing some FPV drone races on TV now. But these are much more custom DIY built quadcopters made from kits that you can buy off the shelf where you do a fair bit of putting things together yourself. You're tweaking, experimenting, even soldering sometimes to get it to work. It's a lot more involved, but when you're done, you get this crazy, sporty, fun experience that is completely manual. So you're not doing these automatic cinema shots. You can rip around obstacle courses at crazy speeds. There's going to be crashes and that's completely normal, but these kits have replacement parts for almost every component. So if you break a propeller, just pop on a new one. Or if you crack an arm, you can replace that too. Turns out when something's made to be broken, it's a lot easier to fix. But the battery life on these things is typically only five to nine minutes tops, and the camera quality is absolutely not a priority. Really, it's just there to be able to give you a real-time feed of where the drone is flying in space, and it's usually paired with a set of goggles that you wear so you can fly the drone from the camera feed like a pilot. And that's where the first-person view part comes in, and while it's not the highest quality footage ever, it is pretty awesome. So now enter DJI's new FPV drone. It's literally called the DJI FPV. That's what they named it. But this takes some of the best things from both of these two very separate worlds of drones and mashes them together into one. So from the ones we're familiar with in the cinema world, a much better 4K camera on a gimbal, stabilized. It's also got obstacle avoidance and a relatively easy learning curve to learn how to fly. But from the other side, well, this thing is it's fast. It's sporty, it rips around in these crazy agile nimble patterns, and it flies like an FPV drone. So the result combined with the goggles is easily the most fun I've ever had flying a drone, easily. Like the drone itself looks the part, of course. You've got these pretty small propellers, non-collapsible arms. The whole thing's pretty compact, but it's definitely in this very aggressive shape. Really the battery at the back is most of the weight, and then there's a 4K stabilized camera up front. And then the last two pieces are the goggles and the remote. The goggles are exactly what you'd expect from the FPV world. They're a low latency transmitter and a monitor for the drone's camera. And they look like this when you have them on. So, great. Then they're not the most comfortable goggles in the world either. The padding is not actually all that soft where they sit around your face, but you gotta remember, they're more than just a display. There's a whole computer in here. There's antennas for communicating with the drone and getting that high resolution video feed with a low enough latency to control it quickly. Plus, you've got some extra controls for the camera and the media, and you can even store that streamed video straight to a micro SD card in the headset, which is actually really smart because if you're doing some particularly risky maneuver over some water or something like that, and you're not sure you're gonna be able to recover the drone, you can record the video to the goggles in case you can't get this card later. So the headset is powered by a battery on a cable that goes into your pocket. Then the controller is pretty simple. It looks kind of just like a Mavic controller minus the spot for your phone. It's the joysticks and an antenna really. So there's three modes for flying this thing. Normal mode, which is best for beginners. It gets you the closest to the other DJI drones. This one is still pretty quick, maxes out at 33 miles per hour, but it's best for shooting with the cameras because the drone doesn't tilt very much and the obstacle avoidance is using the built-in sensors. 
and it'll save you if you go too crazy. It can fly like this for about 15 minutes on a single battery, which is an eternity in the FPV world. Then there's sport mode which unlocks a lot more speed. So this has object detection turned off, and now you're talking a max speed of about 60 miles an hour. That's already faster than almost any other consumer drone right now, and that lets you get those hard turns, the tight corners, and the sweet flybys. It really is a sporty move. It's also kind of wild how this thing sounds as it buzzes by you, or it makes like a really sharp turn. The propellers are moving so fast, it makes this really high-pitched whine, this, this crazy motor rev sound. So the third and final mode is manual mode, which is fully unlocked. So no restrictions, no limits. It's all about you and your control. And it's kind of insane. I personally didn't fly much in manual mode because not only is it the hardest to learn, but it's the riskiest, but you can do flips and all kinds of moves that you can pull off in a normal FPV drone. And it's happening at a new max speed of up to 87 miles per hour. So I found it most comfortable in sport mode, to be honest. It's already faster than almost any other drone I've used, and it's so crazy nimble and fun that it just kind of feels like a video game. It's addicting. And the video quality you can see is really not bad. I mean, compared to what you saw on the Drone Racing League's YouTube channel, it's practically cinema quality. You've got the stabilization from the gimbal, and there's an additional layer of EIS on top that helps smooth out the footage. And in sport mode, you're gonna get the propellers in the shot a bit more than something like a Phantom or a Mavic because it is leaning a lot further forward and turning faster and harder. So you're gonna get more of the props in your shot. But in normal mode, you can use it like a legit film tool if you want to and slow it down, get some nice shots. That's 120 megabits per second at 4K 60 with a cinematic color profile. Also fun fact, we did crash this one as you can kind of see here. Um, but this does seem very resilient to, to, to crashes. This is the type of drone you probably expect to crash a couple of times. Uh, with this one, it crashed upside down and skidded across asphalt for a while, picked it up, replaced the propellers, and it was good to go. Like, nothing's broken, nothing doesn't work, it's still good. DJI also made a simulator that you can learn to fly in before actually taking the drone up into the sky. So. If you want to explore what it means to fly in manual mode and see whether or not you're ready for it, that is definitely the move. It's pretty cool that they built that in and it might save you 1300 bucks. But yeah, like I said, so fun. I've never flown an actual FPV drone and that's probably true for most people watching this. And to me, the DJI FPV represents a bit more accessibility for that FPV experience. Now don't get me wrong, it's still expensive. It's still, the whole kit will be 1299. But if you asked me basically today if I could only use one drone for the rest of my life, I, I, th I think I would pick this one. I think that would be the most fun. So really the difference between getting into building your own drone from parts and flying around an obstacle course versus this basically plug and play version is pretty dramatic. That's where the accessibility comes in and that's where it's so awesome. And that's not even mentioning the joystick controller, which is a pretty sweet alternate version, which can let you fly it around by moving around the joystick in the air, which is awesome. Um, but I'll link some pretty good reviews of this drone if you want by some friends who have had it for longer than me. Um, if you wanna check them out, blow the like button. Now, speaking of things that are the most fun when they go fast, <laughs> that blue car that you were seeing in some of those shots, yeah, that that is the Remac Concept One. This car is on another level and you will absolutely never see one of these in the street. And there's a few reasons why. Okay, so first, there were only eight of these ever made, total. And you might actually already know the story about how one of them doesn't exist anymore, thanks to a little Top Gear incident. So now there's only seven. So they're going for about $1.7 million each, and they are all seven different specs, seven different paint colors, which is pretty cool. They're unique in a lot of ways. But the Concept One is really cool to me because it's an aspirational car. This was the bleeding edge, best possible electric hypercar in 2013. So all that crazy bleeding edge aspirational stuff we see now in like the Tesla Roadster or the Koenigsegg Gemera or even a Lucid Air or something like that. That's the same mentality that Rimac had with this back in 2013. So this is a two-door roadster, as you can see, with four permanent magnet motors, one at each wheel, 
putting out a total of 1200 horsepower and doing zero to 60 miles per hour in 2.5 seconds. It has a two speed gearbox with carbon fiber paddle shifters, which is incredible. And it has a 90 kilowatt hour battery that sits basically right behind the driver's seat for a 210 mile range, which conveniently matches the 210 mile per hour top speed. And fun fact, the glove box is the largest storage in this entire tiny car. There is no trunk, there is no frunk. And today I'm going to drive it and give it a Doug score. Just kidding, I'm not actually gonna review it. But I did get to take it out for a few laps around the block. Shout out to Manhattan Motors for letting me borrow this supercar for a few hours to just experience this. It was absolutely terrifying and I was trying my hardest not to do anything too crazy, yeah, but yeah, Sweet. what an experience. All right, so you might know a little bit about this car already. There were only eight of them ever made. So I'm gonna be very careful here. <laughs> but let's go, okay. So obviously the number one thing you notice getting into this car is it is the lowest, this is the lowest car I've ever seen, lowest car I've ever been in. Everyone who looks at it asks like, what is it? Because you just don't see cars that look this low and it's obvious that there's something special. But driving it? There's no other way to describe it. It feels like a go-kart. It is so compact. There is no rear view mirror. There's no rear visibility. There's very small side mirrors. Everything about the car is very small. But as you feel the steering and, and the driving of it, it's, it's just like a go-kart. If you've ever driven a go-kart, you know what I'm talking about. Now the fun part is You've heard of the quad motors. You know that there's crazy numbers, but there's also just like a feeling and a sound, but a feeling to driving this, which is kind of crazy. And then you have two gears. Here's the thing about the gears. <laughs> I don't know when to switch between them. You have the first gear, which sounds, this is the lowest gear ratio. You're blasting off the line your early speed stuff, and then you have gear two, which is your higher speed, that's gonna go up to your 211 miles an hour. But there's no RPM indicator, just power indicators. I don't really know when to switch gears. I just, I would just when it feels about right. I'm not a professional driver though, so don't do what I do. God, the feeling of changing gears is so sick. It's so sick. This is my, I'm doing my best Doug DeMero impression right now. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> Every little bump is amplified. You feel like you're roll, I feel like I might be lower than an actual skateboard because all the batteries are behind me instead of below me. But there's, there's nothing else I've driven that's anywhere near this. I've driven the McLaren 720S, if you've seen that video. Very different in a lot of ways. But this is even lower than that, which is crazy. There's a ton of, there's a ton of top gear knowledge you might expect to hear about a car like this. But in the one or two days I actually have with it, it's mostly just the visual for me. All the air scoops, all the ventilation, all of the aero. This thing slices through the air. You can also, because it's not a loud engine, hear every single little piece of like a rock or something that goes through the wheel well. There's something about being this close to the ground that makes it feel faster than it is. I'm looking at the speedometer and we're on, a, we're on a closed road, we're not on a highway, I'm not going 100 miles an hour, but it feels like I'm going way faster and I know for a fact that my car is technically on paper faster to 60 than this. This feels faster. This might not have actually technically been the fastest thing I've ever driven, 
but it feels like the fastest thing I've ever driven. By the way, all of the interior footage you just saw was captured by this tiny little camera right here. This is the one I mentioned at the beginning of the video. It's the Insta360 GO 2. It's about the only camera that would fit in that incredibly small cabin, so I wanted to give it a shout out for that. But also, I've been thinking a lot lately about how I want these little tiny cameras, these 360 cameras, to get better quickly because they are so convenient. And I mean, who wouldn't want that? So this GoTo has the best video quality of anything they've made, but also because it's so tiny, it has a bunch of other cool convenient features. Y'all already know I love magnets. This camera has magnets inside it, so it can be slapped onto other metal surfaces, or you can actually use this magnetic chest mount necklace thing. So this little thing has a magnet built in. So what you do is you just wear it like a normal necklace somewhere under your shirt. And there you go, there's your chest mount. The case it comes in is tiny. It looks like a slightly swollen AirPods case maybe, but there's a whole camera in there. And it's a multi-use case, so it charges the camera up to three times over, and it can act as a tripod if you wanted to. I actually got this in-car first-person footage by clipping it to a headband, and honestly, first-person views are rarely done well. It's one of those camera angles that I feel like I see on YouTube more than anywhere else, but I use them a lot. I use them for smartphone reviews all the time because it gives you that feeling like you're holding the phone in your own hand, which is the point of that angle. So in a tiny car like this, most cameras straight up don't fit between me and the steering wheel. So as I do more car videos, I wanna be able to give you that same first person feeling as if you're literally driving the car with me. And so I've, I've done weird versions of this before, held a smartphone in my hand, held a GoPro in my mouth once for a video, and even tried holding a red Komodo with one hand, but that's not exactly safe. It's not ideal, but yeah, this I, I just tucked into my headband and wore it around my head and didn't even think about it. So, shout out to Insta360 for that. I'll link the go-to if you wanna check this one out down below. But also, let's collectively cross our fingers and hope that these little action cameras and 360 cameras continue to get better over time, because I can see a lot of use cases where this is gonna be very useful for me, especially as we do more car videos. Oh. And this is also uh, probably a pretty good opportunity to mention that I'll be collaborating a little bit more officially with Top Gear. So, you guys might have seen the tweet announcement, but yes, more car videos. I'm going to be writing for Top Gear magazine, and they're gonna be helping out with the videos for the autofocus series on the channel. So, we might even appear in each other's videos at some point, which would be cool. But, figured I'd get that official announcement into this video which is super exciting. So either way, that's been it. Thanks for watching this dope tech on small, fast, fun, lightweight objects. And uh, this has been a fun one. Catch you guys in the next video. Peace.